Hi there. This is a lecture uh, looking at evaluating the usefulness of sociological research methods and today I'm going to focus on looking at issues of reliability and representativeness. Um, just a quick reminder that we've already looked at ethical issues and uh, validity. Um, uh, we may have also looked at practical issues, um, but just to remind you, ethical issues, making sure no harm comes to participants, they're not deceived, and they're not harmed in any way through the research, um, and they know that they can withdraw at any point. Um, validity is very much about the truth, okay, how close does the research get to the truth of exactly what's happening, or does that method make it a bit easier for participants to lie, or does the data not really tell you the truth of what's going on, so that's something else to bear in mind. So we're going to start off by talking about reliability. Uh, reliability essentially is how repeatable are the findings of a study. Um, so if you really struggle to remember this, try and go reliability, repeatable, repeatable, reliable. Okay, try and remember those two words together to remember what reliability means. So can you repeat the study easily and get similar findings? Okay, because if it can be repeated in a different time or place and produce similar results, it's said to be reliable. So in order to be reliable, sociologists need to make their methods really clear so that another researcher can then repeat the study at a different time, or maybe even a different society completely. Uh, and that makes it quite easy then to make comparisons between maybe the study that happened the year before or maybe a study in a different country, which is really useful. So the idea is that someone else could copy that study really easily because it's so repeatable. OK, so giving you an example, they have three guys with a clipboard all using exactly the same set of questions, for example, um, all using the same research method. And look how happy they are because their method is so reliable. So any methods that are standardised, um, uh, that means they have clear procedures to follow. So they might have the same questions, they might have uh, the same setting for research, or they might look at exactly the same set of data each year to look at patterns and trends. So you might look at, I don't know, crime statistics for each year to identify whether there was an inc increase or decrease in crime or what crime was going up and what crime was going down. Exactly the same data set that you analyse each year. That's a reliable approach to, to research. Questionnaires are considered high in reliability because the questions stay the same for every participant and the exact questionnaire can be used easily again by other researchers. And that doesn't matter whether they're open or closed questions because they're exactly the same questions. OK, so they're considered quite high in reliability. Structured interviews are also considered high in reliability. So can you have a quick think and maybe add your, to your notes? Why are structured interviews also considered high in reliability, sometimes known as formal interviews? Why are they considered high in reliability? Methods that are low in reliability tend to be unstructured methods that don't follow a strict procedure, they're not standardised. They might use open questions and quite often the researcher has little control over the directions participants may go in when they're um, answering questions or if it's an observation they can't control the behaviour of everyone, for example, that they're observing at the time. Uh, so that makes it difficult to replicate. You couldn't easily replicate a uh, covert participant observation with a completely different group because you can't control everyone's behaviour. Uh, so I've given the example here of unstructured interviews. Um, they flow like a conversation. So that's a big bonus because they're much more relaxed and generally a bit more valid. However, because there's no fixed questions, it's quite difficult to replicate an exact unstructured interview with another subject or another participant, um, or even a year later to conduct the same unstructured interview following the same for format. And quite often in unstructured interviews, again, one of their strengths is if something interesting or unexpected comes up in the conversation, the interview, the researcher might go, actually, I want to find out more about that. And they might ask what's called probing questions on that area. Now, the researcher might not have even planned to ask those questions. Um, so definitely that would make it difficult to replicate that sort of interview with someone else. OK, so the good thing is they're finding out interesting information. They're getting a more valid picture of what's going on. The bad thing is it's not a very reliable approach to research. It's difficult to replicate. Also not very practical because it takes a long time to do an unstructured interview. So what other methods do you think are low in reliability? What other research methods don't use standardised procedures? That makes it difficult to replicate, do you think? 
Just want to give a quick warning here because this happens so often in sociology. Uh, reliability is a completely separate issue to validity. Uh, so remember, reliability is can you repeat the research easily? Validity is very much about whether what you're finding out is true. Uh, and quite often, a piece of research that is reliable is quite often low in validity. OK, and the other way around. So a very valid bit of research can actually be low in reliability. OK, um, think about that sort of seesaw that I've talked about before. It's really important that you don't get these two models. Quite often in other subjects, um, you talk about a reliable witness, for example, which would be somebody who tells the truth. Um, but that's not what reliability means in sociology. Reliability in sociology is just, and psychology, is can you easily repeat the study and get similar results? Can someone else copy that study easily? Okay, again, reliability is sometimes in history is very much about truth, but in sociology, reliability isn't about truth. It's about replicating the study. So don't get them muddled up because uh, um, you might lose marks in an exam. The next issue we're going to talk about is representativeness. Does your sample represent the wider group? So when a researcher starts a sociological investigation, they want to make sure that their findings can be applicable to a wider group than the ones in the study. Otherwise, all you can say is you, you've researched, I don't know, the 10 people you've studied. So not no one else is going to be interested, really, if you can't apply your research to a wider group. Um, so a starting point is deciding who is your target population? Like Who are you actually trying to find out more about? Uh, who do you want to say your research actually applies to? This is what's known as a target population, which we'll look at a bit more in sampling. So, for example, if I wanted to conduct research into why teenage girls read more than teenage boys in England, my target population is all teenagers in England. So there's no point in me talking to, um, you know, uh, people in Scotland. Um, there is no point in me asking about the reading habits of people in their 50s. Um, so the, my target population is teenagers in England. OK, that's the people I want to basically can apply my research to. So it would take me ages to research every teenager in England. OK, I couldn't ask them all questions. It would even be difficult to send a questionnaire to every teenager in England. So instead, I need a smaller group. And this is what's known as a sample. OK, and that will represent the whole group. So in my sample, I need to make sure that I have a balance of both genders, because I'm looking at boys and girls. I need to make sure I've got all ages of the teens represented, all ethnicities in the UK represented, and I need to make sure that all classes are in my sample. Uh, sorry for the typo there. So all classes are represented. So I need, you know, working, middle, you know, all classes represented. This is what would give me what's known as a wide cross section of the population I want to research. OK, and what it means is that I can then say whatever I find, I might find I know girls read more because their parents read to them more as, as young children. I can then say this therefore applies to all teenagers in England because my sample that represents those um, all teenagers in England seems to have that pattern. And this is what's known as generalising, when you generalise your findings to the rest of the target population beyond your sample. So what is it that makes a study representative or generalisable? What sorts of things do we need to look out for? Well, the larger the sample, the more representative. OK, so if you can find a method that makes it easy to get a large sample, your research is much more likely to be representative. It does. It is a bit more complex than that, and we will look at that in, in another lecture on sampling. Because as I've given you in that pie chart to the right, you need to kind of think, actually, uh, I need to make sure my sample represents my target population. So I wouldn't I might go 50 50 or for boys and girls, for example, but I might not go, um, you know, one third of them need to be um, black. One third of them need to be white. One third of them need to be Asian, because that is not how that those groups are represented in our wider society. OK, so I need to be much more careful about how I select the numbers of people in my set in my sample. But I'll get into that in another lecture. So don't panic too much about that. So 
A very representative method is questionnaires. They are quick and easy to distribute, uh, mainly by email these days. You know, you could do them in the post, which would make it a little bit slower and a bit more costly. But yeah, most questionnaires sent out by email um, or in a, in a Google form. Uh, so you can get them to a large number of people. Um, but other methods, it's a bit more difficult to be representative because they are so time consuming. Uh, so can you give me a couple of examples of research methods that are time consuming? I'll give you one. Interviews are time consuming. Uh, even if they're structured, they're time consuming. You've still got to sit down in a room with a person and go through some questions. Okay. So for the researcher, that is time consuming to do. For the participants, that's pretty time consuming to do as well. So what other methods can you think of that are time consuming? One thing I want to mention here, it's a bit of an evaluation point really of questionnaires, is that not everyone actually responds to questionnaires. Um, you might have ignored um, a Google form being sent to you. You might have ignored a questionnaire. Um, so that would actually lower the study's representativeness because not everyone's replying. Uh, and then it's also worth thinking only certain people do respond to some questionnaires. So what sorts of people have got lots of time on their hands uh, to reply? So they might be people, but you know, even your age group might have a bit more time because perhaps they're not working. Um, or you guys might not respond because you're too busy because you've got too much schoolwork on, for example. Um, maybe only elderly people will respond to questionnaires um, because they've got a bit more time. But then are they less likely to respond to email questionnaires because they might not be so good online? So these are all things to think about with questionnaires. Even though you think they're representative, not everyone will respond to them. Uh, and another but I just want to add in here, like even though we want research to be representative, there are some groups in society that, you know, you can only really study in small groups that will be unrepresentative. Uh, and these groups can be hidden groups, they can be sort of deviant. Uh, so by deviant, I mean they might be doing something illegal or something that's considered a bit wrong in society. So that can be all the way from criminal gangs, uh, or it could be, you know, students who are truanting from school. Um, so they might be reluctant to take part in representative research methods. They might not want to fill out a questionnaire on, hey, you know, this is how many crimes I commit every day. This is the reasons why I commit my crimes. This is what I do with all the money from my crime. I'm likely to fill out a questionnaire. So you'll have to use unrepresentative methods to study those types of groups. Otherwise, they're not going to trust you. They're not going to talk to you. So have a think about what methods they might be. Just a quick warning here. You need to be wary of accidental bias in your sample. So you might try really hard to make sure your sample accurately reflects your target population. But it's worth double checking, um, depending on the sampling method you've chosen, whether you've got an imbalance of genders, like what if by complete fluke, 80% of your samples are female and only 20% are male. That's going to be a bias. You're going to get more female responses than male. Is there a cultural bias? Like is everyone in your study white? then that's not going to represent maybe the whole of your target population. Uh, is there a class bias? Make, like maybe only middle class people have, have agreed to take part. You know, Then that's a problem because you're only going to get their perspective on the issue you're studying. And you need a good sampling method to be sure this doesn't happen, which we'll look at in another lecture. So I'm going to leave that there. Thanks for listening. Um, and we'll take up sampling in another lecture shortly.